Good evening. My name is Joan Concannon and I'm Director of External Relations and Director of York Festival of Ideas. Welcome to the University of York and specifically to our new online event series Behind the Scenes, which has been developed and designed in partnership with our student union uh, USU. I want to especially thank Patrick O'Donnell, our fantastic student union president, who's been so supportive of this endeavor. I'm really thrilled that Patrick's here this evening and he'll be wrapping up this event uh, later on. Behind the Scenes aims to do just what it says on the tin. We want to give the opportunity to explore professions and industries which are less visible to the public, to give you an insight into jobs and uh, that you might never have imagined. Our series will span the escalating impact of cybercrime tonight, the fascinating world of museums, the integral but often overlooked role that sound direction plays in a film's success, and the challenges and the future of the media. This series is part of our York Ideas platform of online events. As a university for public good, we're passionately committed to engaging with as many different audiences as we possibly can. We want to deliver stimulating and engaging events that make you think, make you act, and make you empathize. The impact of COVID-19 has made many of us feel that our worlds have shrunk dramatically. Many of us are working at home while juggling caring and homeschooling or studying. So we want to be able to provide a departure point, if you will, that can take you somewhere else, if only virtually. We often encourage our students at the University of York to try something new, and we hope very much that this series will enable you to experience something new and that you enjoy the journey with us. So thank you again for joining us tonight. It's a huge privilege and delight to welcome Will Dixon, who is also, fantastically, a graduate of the University of York and our amazing chair for this evening, Kate Ravelous. Thank you very much. So yes, I'm a science journalist based here in York and I'll be chairing tonight's event. And I'm delighted to welcome Will Dixon, who's head of Future Networks and Technology at the World Economic Forum. Um, Will's got over a decade's worth of experience, um, which has included working on major cybercrime investigations for the UK government, um, a previous role as Global Head of Intelligence at Barclays Bank, and he has a master's degree from King's College London, and as Joan said, he's also an alumni from here at the University of York in history. Um, I've got plenty of questions to ask Will, but we'd also love to hear from you, so I therefore encourage you to ask questions using the Q&A function on your screen. Um, and this is available throughout the event, so questions can be asked at any time. So to kick things off, um, I think Will is going to share a short presentation um, that will introduce us to the World Economic Forum and his role there. So I'll hand over to you, Will. Thank you very much. I appreciate that, Kate. And thank you to the university for inviting me today. Um, hopefully everyone will find this fascinating and get some insights on my journey from history graduate at York University to the World Economic Forum and I'm running the cybersecurity program at the World Economic Forum in what is a incredibly technical domain but an increasingly strategically important one as well. So what I thought I'd do is maybe give you a little bit of insight into what we actually do at the World Economic Forum which is a very kind of high profile organisation but from the outside can be slightly opaque. So maybe I can demystify that a little bit as well. So I don't know if we've got the slides ready, but I'll give a little bit of a journey into the world of the World Economic Forum and cybersecurity. So the World Economic Forum, it's a international organization based in Switzerland. It's best well known for the Davos meeting where once a year global leaders from the public and the private um, space meet in the Swiss resort of Davos and they talk about strategically and systemically important issues. But actually what's not known is it's, it's an international organization that's focused on public-private partnerships. And it's a membership-based organization, principally made up of around 1,000 of the world's biggest companies. And what we really concentrate on is convening the most senior uh, policymakers in national governments, academics and research institutions, as well as the CEOs and the C-suite of those organizations. And what we do is we try and convene and talk about strategically and systemically important issues. And increasingly, cybersecurity has become one of the most important issues that global leaders, both in national governments, as well as international business, want to convene and discuss issues around. So next slide might give us a little bit of insight as well, if I could see that, please. So yes, what does the World Economic Forum do? 
So yes, once a year, we host the World Economic Forum annual meeting in Davos, which is actually one of the biggest media events in the world after the Olympics. And around 3,000 leaders from international business and public policy converge on the Davos resort, and they talk about strategically important and systemic issues. And what are those issues that we talk about? What do the likes of Donald Trump come to Davos to discuss? And a lot of people think that the World Economic Forum is a secret organization where the global elites discuss things and shape the world. And what do they discuss? Well, actually, we, we often publish what they're about to discuss. And once a year, we publish the Global Risk Report. And this year, in 2021, cybersecurity was the fourth biggest risk global leaders, both public policy in international government and international business, viewed as the world's biggest risks. And what do we discuss in cybersecurity? Well, we publish that as well. So if anybody wants any of the resources about cybersecurity, we put out our flagship product um, in November for the annual cybersecurity meeting as well, which we host in Geneva. And we very much view cybersecurity as a strategic systemic issue. It first appeared on the Global Risk Report in around 2012, and every year it's increased in importance. And it's increased in importance because the impact that incidents and attacks have had on the global economy for those leaders has become more impactful. And to give you a little bit of context, cybersecurity is the fourth biggest risk after climate change and pandemics. So at the very, very top of international business and government, it's seen as a very important issue, but it's seen as a very esoteric technical issue as well. So maybe, maybe I can explore why that is as well. Um, if I can see the next slide. So to give you a little bit of an example of why cybersecurity is seen as a big strategic issue of global importance, it's not just a technical issue. It's not just a computer science degree based issue about securing networks and technology. Increasingly, cybersecurity is about providing trust in the integrity and processes in which modern societies increasingly rely. And last year, at the very top of international government, there were some major cybersecurity issues that had to be discussed. You can see the picture there, which is at the G7, where back in, in the autumn, a major trade decision was made about the need for the G7 to move away from a, a national 5G-based provider and the need to create an alternative 5G ecosystem, which meant that they had better security assurance in those networks and technologies. That decision was a major international policy decision. And some examples that have followed this, even in the last three months, have indicated that. SolarWinds was one of the biggest cyber attacks that's impacted US national critical infrastructure and caused major rifts between US and Russian-based policymakers. And Emotet and TrickBot, which are some of the biggest malware campaigns that we've seen in the last few years, also were disrupted. And if people want to understand some of the international policy incidents and some of the international issues associated with those, I'd, I'd, I'd advise them to research some of the very complex policy spaces those types of operations and disruption operations um, indicated. TrickBot was taken down by Cybercom in the run-up to the presidential election, a Russian-based crime gang disrupted by a national government entity. And this type of transformation about cybersecurity becoming an international policy issue has actually only happened in a very short space of time. So a lot of the frameworks and maturity around that are increasingly um, needing to be constructed. And again, business leaders see this as an international economic issue. Globally, we're spending around 150 billion pounds a year now on cybersecurity services. That's equivalent to what the globe's spending on cancer research drugs. So we're actually spending hundreds of billions of pounds each year defending against cyber attacks. And global losses are estimated at around a trillion dollars a year as well. It's a major technology and operational issue as well. Just last year, over 2 billion credentials, personal information associated with you, your name, your address, your credit card, your email address was spilled out onto the open internet and can be used by criminals for, um, for nefarious activity. What's critical though, to understanding the deterrence models is we published some research with one of our, four, uh, with one of our think tanks last year which is cybercrime has an incredibly difficult attribution rate. Essentially, only three in 1,000 incidents that are reported to the police will ever result in any activity or arrest. Now, that's a huge challenge 
for criminal justice outcomes and for what the government needs to do to be able to protect its citizens and its economies from the threat of cyber attack. So what's behind that? You know, what is the issue here? And on the next slide, maybe some food for thought for us before we get into our um, discussion. Cybercrime, and we've kind of got a hashtag here, which is, it, which is about the hacker hoodie. Um, Cybercrime isn't about children and kids in their bedrooms messing around on, on the internet. This is a highly lucrative business. And just like the internet's revolutionized things such as e-commerce, um, e actually e-crime and high-tech crime has inc been incredibly impacted by the internet and the platform economy. So cybercrime is dominated by an underground economy. So the things that will attack you, ransomware, malware, fraud, they're actually all interconnected services that exist in the underground economy, on the dark web, hundreds of forums dedicated to providing those services. What it means is the barrier to entry to cybercrime is incredibly low, and it's also incredibly lucrative. You are able to buy credit cards, um, stolen personal information for as little as $5 um, a card as well. What's also fascinating in this space and working um, in previous government spaces, actually it's an incredibly hardened criminal core that drive most of the major innovation in cybercrime. And it's estimated by Europol, and there's a great resource, which is the IOPTA they produce each year, that really it's around two to 300 individuals and very hardened cybercrime groups that are based in very difficult jurisdictions to reach that drive the underground economy. And those crime gangs have actually been behind the explosion of cybercrime over the last 10 years, where this is a major volume crime issue, which is still wrapped up as a high-tech crime. And for criminals, it's an incredibly easy space to remain anonymous. And the challenges of encryption and large scale encryption methodologies and remaining anonymous on the internet has meant that the attribution models and the deterrence models are incredibly difficult for the government and private sectors to be able to defeat. So maybe some last food for thought about what has this meant from a career perspective as well on the next slide. We've put out some research as well as the World Economic Forum that globally we think there's around 4 million vacancies um, in the cybersecurity space. And actually that's going up each year. Cybersecurity is an incredibly growing fast space. And a lot of people think it's solely a technical space. And many of the jobs, they are technical. If you want to reverse engineer malware, if you want to be able to do vulnerability management and vulnerability assessments, they are technical careers. However, huge diversity in the field. And actually, if you want to shape international policy, if you want to work in international relations, if you want to have a legal degree, if you want to be able to work on kind of the impact of cybersecurity on trade, if you want to run big teams, program management, be an entrepreneur, cybersecurity is one of the fastest growing fields in the world. And I've had a hugely rewarding um, uh, career over the last 15 years in a field that I never thought that I'd enter. And um, I didn't come from a technical background, but I found it an incredibly exciting, innovative and rewarding field to be able to be participating in. And I think that final thought there, which is cybersecurity is not just a technical field. What our message is as the World Economic Forum is, is cybersecurity is about providing trust and integrity in the services and um, parts of the uh, society and economy that which we rely. And that's been hugely um, indicated by the COVID pandemic and actually our increasingly dependence on digital infrastructure and how important that is for our modern societies. We as the cybersecurity community were absolutely integral to making sure that those processes, those parts of the economy and the parts of society that we depend on um, are available and that we have trust in them. And that's incredibly important and incredibly rewarding too. So hopefully it'll uh, be interesting discussion. I can give some insights and maybe some uh, food for thought for people. And I look forward to the discussion and, and everybody's questions as well. So that's my kind of my slide to my pitch. And, and Kate, I'm looking forward to the conversation. Thank you, Will. That's a really fascinating introduction and fairly sobering as well. Um, I want to just step back a little bit. We've had a couple of audience members. So there's Callum Kennedy Mann, who's a current history and undergraduate at York, and um, somebody else, both asking, um, when did you sort of start to take an interest in cybersecurity and what drew you into this profession? 
Um, it's a really good question. I think we touched a little bit of this, Kate, when we when we had a conversation earlier in the in the week. Um, I think what what I was really interested in um, when I was when I was at university was international relations, and I was really interested in the kind of like the world around me and how countries and uh, and politics were were interacting. And after university, after university, I went to go live in uh, China for a year. And um, after that, I, I kind of was, I was convinced that I wanted to work maybe potentially in the foreign office or I wanted to work in government service uh, for certain. And I went to go work at a, a well-known government department that's based down in, uh, based down in Cheltenham GCHQ. And I was lucky enough to be recruited into them. And that really started me on my cybersecurity journey. Um, and I think, you know, I think there's a myth that potentially you need to have solely technical training you need to start in these types of fields. But what I what I found in my career and, and the kind of the, the major roles that I've had was that what I did as an arts graduate was be able to analyze large quantities of data, both technical or kind of like informational. And the real skill that you learn is about how to translate that into strategic insight. And the real skill is being able to communicate that insight at various levels, either technical level, operational level, or strategic level. And as, as I've gained more experience, I found that my ability to be able to message um, about why this issue is important has actually pulled me up through my career as well. So um, I've been incredibly fortunate um, um, in, in maybe that kind of early stage of my career that I got great exposure at a great organization. So there's some other questions coming in here from people who are interested in what kind of qualifications are useful for working in the field of cybersecurity. I mean, you're saying that your history degree was, was actually, you know, the skills that you learned there have really translated well into this field. And what other qualifications are, are good things to bring into this field? Yeah, and I think I think I was, you know, I was I was very fortunate that uh, cybersecurity was was a pretty niche field when I when I first entered when I left university two thousand and six two thousand and eight, um, um, where I think there was kind of um, there was maybe a little bit more kind of like room to maneuver, um, you know, in this field. What you've seen now is security and cybersecurity really maturing as a profession. And actually, there's this huge diversity in the profession as well. So I, I think it'd be amiss of me to say that, you know, actually, I'm super, super interested in, you know, um, you know, doing technical investigations and me not to say to you, well, actually, it'd be incredibly useful to make sure that you're doing some computer science modules or you're doing a forensics kind of, uh, you know, going into a forensics um, background, you know, maybe after university. I think it really depends on the type of job and role that you want and enjoy. Um, I suppose what I'm saying is, is that, you know, if you're, uh, if you're interested, say, in uh, international relations, etc, you know, actually cybersecurity is a potential career for you as well, given, you know, the impact it has. Um, but I'd certainly be saying in, in some of the more technical fields, I'd definitely be looking at, you know, that career pathway, you know, I'd be, I'd be out there maybe speaking to some of the companies that are recruiting in this space and, and what would be useful um, as well. I, I think... I think it'd be, you know, if, if you're wanting to move into one of the more technical areas within cybersecurity, you should be looking at some of those technical qualifications as well, even as part of maybe, you know, doing an arts-based degree as well. And did you have a strategy in, the, in your career trajectory? Did you sort of plan out goals that you needed to achieve in, in order to get where you were, or was it more of a serendipitous path? Yeah, I think, you know, you, you meet people who, you know, they always wanted to be, you know, uh, a lawyer, they always wanted to be a doctor, and, you know, they, they go through that path. I think, I think that was definitely not the case for me. Like, I really didn't know what I wanted to do. Um, what I was fortunate, uh, what, where I was fortunate was I joined an organization where I was maybe allowed to try out what I was good at and what I wasn't good at. And, you know, um, um, what I found was was that some of the things that excited me, you know, particularly working in into you know like criminal based investigations, you know, uh, working with the police domestically and internationally, you know, I was I was really interested in that, and I was also you know in a position where I you know a lot of the policy space was moving, so I, I was fortunate that I was kind of able to maybe test and try and fail a little bit 
and maybe kind of get on my feet a little bit. And, you know, really, I, I probably, you know, didn't have, you know, my best years, um, you know, until I was in my late 20s, early 30s, where I basically worked out that I was good at some stuff and not not so good at other stuff. So my own advice in that would be, you know, maybe maybe try to aim for the kind of a good organization with good structure around it and, you know, good leadership. And hopefully they'll they'll provide the space for you to learn that, too. So just to get onto the job that you're doing now, and let's talk a little bit about that. What what does your job entail? What's a typical day like for you? And what are the things you have responsibility for? Yeah, so it's a really good question. I, I suppose the main uh, the, the main answer is it's incredibly varied. I'd say that um, I'm not involved operationally anymore in kind of like providing kind of like actual security to the business as well. Like it's definitely kind of, of about convening research, leadership messaging, leadership workshops, et cetera, as well. So a typical day for me might be we are preparing, you know, for a meeting where we know that, you know, chief strategy officers from, you know, um, large, you know, automobile mobility sector, they're all meeting to talk about how they could collectively tackle cybersecurity. Well, in the build up to that, it'd be my job to make sure that I was engaging with each, each of those strategy officers, that we were preparing the material, that the kind of like the research and the insights and the discussion was how we'd shaped it beforehand. And then it can be incredibly varied. So, you know, like uh, actually yesterday I was on a call between the Depay authorities, the Singaporean authorities and, and the Israelis about mutual recognition frameworks for, you know, certification of IoT devices. And, you know, my job is to make sure that I can connect those people and, you know, explore maybe with our, uh, you, know, uh, you know, our government affairs people, whether that's something that we could potentially do. Or, you know, it might be incredibly, you know, uh, you know, uh, boring research, you know, that I, you know, and uh, best research and, it can be incredibly varied. And um, I'd say there's a lot less travel involved now with COVID so, than there used to be. Um, but yeah, we, we do a lot of project work and we do a lot of convening of very senior leaders on this as a topic. So we've got a good question here. What, in terms of defending against cybersecurity threats, keeps you awake at night? Yeah, it's a, it's a really good question. So I think... Um, what what you've seen when I when I certainly when I started in my career, cybercrime was incredibly dominated by attacks against financial institutions and really about kind of like harvesting financial data and targeting financial payment systems. And the reason for that was um, the way that you kind of like monetize cybercrime was heavily dependent on targeting the banks and having money laundering networks around. That's really shifted in the last two, three years, um, particularly uh, cryptocurrency. So what you increasingly find is ransomware attacks against you know, very poorly defended hospitals, local government, um, you know, universities, et cetera. And I think that's, that's the thing that I've seen where the crime has moved away from being you know, ultimately something which is about financial impact to something that's actually like really impacts, you know, the lives of, you know, people and, and actually some people really aren't equipped to be able to deal with this as a, um, as this attack. So I, I'd say, you know, what keeps me awake is, is kind of like these very, very destructive attacks targeted at very poorly defended, you know, local government services and, and hospitals, et cetera. I think it's, um, it's definitely a trend that we've seen. We've seen it in the UK. We see it in America, we see it across Europe um, and the Far East through all our partners as well. And what sort of tactics do you employ to ensure that you're always one step ahead of those cyber criminals? Yeah, so I mean, one of my, one of my roles um, uh, when I was at Barclays Bank, uh, you know, Barclays, big, big financial institution, very well resourced. Um, and, and really my role at Barclays Bank was to investigate and be deeply knowledgeable about the most advanced adversaries, their TTPs, you know, their tools, their tactics and their procedures. And a lot of people, you know, they think about cybersecurity is something that just kind of like comes out of, you know, attacks, you know, their email inbox or attacks their network, but actually behind it, there's real crime groups. And, you know, by really studying and gaining insight into them, you know, working with law enforcement, working with kind of like the cybersecurity community, you can actually get very close to understanding how they're operating. And once you understand how they operate, you can, you can really then try and translate that into, um, you know, building defenses um, as well. So 
Um, yeah, that, that was certainly something that we spent um, a lot of time at Barclays doing. At the, at the World Economic Forum, we kind of move up a little bit like at a more strategic level, and you can see that from our, some of our reporting. And um, we go a little bit further out. We did a really big research um, um, piece of work with, with a lot of members and, and the University of Oxford last year on the impact of next generation technology on the cyber landscape. So how will artificial intelligence, you know, kind of like be used by attackers and how can we use it to defend? What's the impact of quantum computing over the next five to 10 years on the threat landscape? So and in many ways, you know, that's been incredibly useful for organizations as well to start building kind of like, you know, their investment portfolio, start building their risk register, start understanding maybe where they should be investing from you know, a technology or a government affairs standpoint as well. So um, really, you know, really the last five years about have been about studying the crime gangs and how they will exploit, how they are exploiting and how they will exploit technology. So there's a question come in here saying, is cybercrime a first world problem? Actually, that's a, that's a really insightful question. Um, certainly, I would say, um, Certainly, I would say the kind of like the early parts of the cybercrime journey, you know, those you kind of like the last 10 years, you know, 2010, you know, through to maybe 2018, were definitely targeted against large, well resourced institutions, large, well resourced countries, because a lot that is that ultimately was where, you know, the money was. You know, there was, you know, that's that's where the attacks were happening. What you've seen over the last maybe two, three, two, three years when some of these kind of like more accessible targeting um, has taken place where, you know, the, the barrier to entry, the cash out methods have got easier, the targeting has got easier. You've actually seen on the ground economies spring up in South Africa, Central Asia, Africa, um, South America has an, an incredibly uh, vibrant kind of on the ground economy as well. So you definitely see local cybercrime economies springing up all around the world uh, and in even places you know like in Africa you'll, you'll find that maybe you know some of these are the, the most sophisticated attacks but you know you'll there's definitely kind of a um, uh, there's definitely a very very aggressive kind of on the ground cybercrime network target in their institutions as well and a great example of this as well is um, there was quite um, one of the most famous attacks that happened was called the Bank of Bangladesh hack you know where they tried to steal a billion dollars from, from the Central Bank of Bangladesh. And what, what you'd found is, is crime gangs had actually been going up against the likes of Barclays, the likes of JP Morgan, and finding actually that the investments that they'd made, you know, were relatively, you know, um, successful, you know, it was hard to target these banks. But you found that actually there was a whole raft of financial institutions in less defended parts of the world that were actually kind of like much easier to, to, to target. And what you've seen is maybe some of the bigger bank heists uh, and cybercrime attacks have actually been in uh, developing economies, which are as well resourced as well. And, and they're really at the front line of this as well. Interesting. And for, for you, I mean, you've been doing this now for over a decade. What does it feel like to be in the midst of a cyber attack like the solar winds one, for example? Or, you know, what, what's do you sort of have palpitations and, you know, is it, what does it feel like? Yeah, so I, you know, I was, I was, um, I was fortunate that I've um, fortunate slash, I've seen it from like multiple problem spaces now. Um, certainly, when I was in government, and it was very new, um, and the and, and, a, and a lot of the time the processes were kind of like new about how you were dealing with this as an incident. Uh, you know, that that was definitely a steep learning curve. Um, you know, when, when the country was really starting to kind of like recognize that this was like a major concern and actually what was the national response, et cetera, that was definitely, uh, that was definitely a kind of like a, a learning experience. What I'd say once you went into the private sector, it really depended on like how well resourced and how well exercised were you. So I spent three years at Barclays and, um, went through like a major, you know, uh, security program as, as one of the kind of like the, the leadership team there. You know, we're talking hundreds of millions uh, kind of like in, in investment. And, you know, at the beginning, yes, the processes were not very kind of like, you know, well slick or well oiled and incident kind of like handling was tough. By the end of it, you were very well exercised, you know, uh, you were dealing with incidents all the time and you were very, very good. 
a lot of it came down to training process and kind of organizations being really well structured and resourced to be able to deal with this. And, um, and actually you, you find actually that increasingly organizations have heavily invested in, in this as well. So, um, it certainly can be a, a very stressful environment. And um, actually, you know, if people are interested, you know, chief information security officers, the chief security officers of, um, of, of enterprises have the, one of the highest levels of mental stress and kind of, you know, um, in, in industry, it can be an incredibly stressful job for, for sure. <laughs> what do you think is the best approach to reducing cybercrime? Do you agree with close surveillance of internet traffic to reduce crime? Um, it's, so this has been what we're really getting at here is kind of like what is the role of the state and what is the role of you know, what is the adequate response for mitigating this threat and what are the appropriate tools and oversights um, for this. Um, the UK very uh, rolled out the National Cyber Security Centre and one of its kind of like key tenants with its, was its active cyber defence programme. Now, the Active Cyber Defence Programme was very clear that it was going to work with private sector partners, including the internet service providers, in trying to provide safe internet for citizens at scale. So very much doing things upstream against the threat, which is, well, if there's lots of domains that we know about, that we know are malicious, maybe they should be hosted in the UK and we're going to take steps to make sure they're not hosted in the UK with lots of people who control that in the private sector as well. And actually, it was incredibly successful. I think what you're talking about is, you know, close surveillance, what actually we're talking about in detail. You know, um, are we really talking about hacking of individuals? And are we talking about, uh, you know, very, very kind of like close surveillance, um, you know, maybe overseas as well? And um, that, is, that has definitely been a debate that's happened in the UK um, ever since the Snowden leaks, you know, and they, they came out and that, that was a very, very kind of prominent debate about what is the appropriate response of national governments and their um, state apparatus in providing protection in, um, on the internet. And they, it's an ongoing debate. So to go back to the Snowden leaks, I mean, that was obviously a real key moment. What do you think we really learned from that and how has cybersecurity changed since then? Yeah, so, you know, looking back, looking back now, um, at that period of time, uh, and being a history student, you can maybe kind of put a bit of context around it, which was, that was really a debate about what is the role of government in providing security in an internet age? And what are we as citizens comfortable with regarding their capabilities and the oversight that we need to, um, um, to put over them? And, you know, that, you know, a lot of it came into the debate, such as, you know, the comms data bill, you know, the Snoopers Charter, the oversight regime around the intelligence services and the intelligence agencies. And, you know, this is, this is not a debate that's, you know, um, closed, you know, um, this is a debate that's also happening around the, the major technology providers. One of the biggest discussions last year between law enforcement and major technology providers uh, very much in this space about kind of like the role of government and surveillance, et cetera, was when Facebook decided um, and is rolling out end-to-end -end encryption of its messaging service. Mm -hmm. Now, what Facebook is saying is we provide a huge ecosystem and our, our duty to our customers is to make sure that is as safe as it possibly can be. And the way to make that as safe as possibly could be is we're going to do end-to-end -end encryption, which means nobody can see the traffic, including us. Now, if you're Interpol and Europol and the national authorities in the US and the UK, you basically had, um, you know, that data source and Facebook were the largest providers of tip-offs for child, sexplo child sexual exploitation cases. So, you know, Facebook has said a good thing, which has got a billion customers, we have to provide safe and secure ecosystem from them. But by turning, basically you've turned off the ability to be able to gain insight potentially in a threat that the government cares about. And actually, how will the government replace that as a potential capability if they can no longer have those tip-offs or see that traffic? And um, it's, it's definitely a debate, you know, there's, um, and you know, you see different countries that have taken different approaches. Um, so yeah, that's why cybersecurity is so fascinating as well, which is, it's not just about networks and technology, really some of this stuff is about what is the role of, you know, the government 
and the roles and rights of the individual in the internet age. And, um, and that's definitely played out over the last 10 years. So Chris Cameron asks, are things getting better or much, much worse? And what are the key things that you think need to happen to give the good guys an upper hand? Yeah, so I, I'd say there's, there's definitely been progress. You can see that, uh, you know, you, you can see that investment in cybersecurity skills, capacity, uh, goods and services, uh, kind of strategic level is improving. It is no longer the case where I think that business leaders or the public in large doesn't know about cybersecurity as an issue. There's definitely a very high level awareness of this is a problem. And um, the real question is, is for both businesses, SMEs, you know, individuals, which is, well, what do I actually do about it? And in many kind of like indicators, actually it's getting worse. You know, um, you know, we are spending hundreds of millions of pounds each year on, the, on this as an issue um, as a country. Globally, I gave that figure as 150 billion. That's going up each year. Um, as we put more and more of our lives and our economies and our societies on the internet, on digital infrastructure, cybersecurity will continue to grow as a problem. And I'd say, you know, what, and you, depending on the type of expert you ask, you'll get different responses. To me, and my background, it, it's still a crime type. And to me, the fact that we've got two, 300 criminals and crime gangs that really drive this kind of like trillion dollar kind of like issue, says to me that actually one of at the heart of the discussion still has to be about what, what is the role of law enforcement? How can private sector law enforcement and the government really come together to build like a more effective deterrence model to make sure that this kind of like is a crime that you know if you conduct you know there are consequences to it and um, that's certainly not the case now and um, I definitely you know my personal opinion that's where I like to see real improvements as well but it's very difficult you know this is a tough space to investigate. Mm. And I mean somebody has asked here um, if we're spending 150 billion on cyber security What's why? Why are we not managing? Why are we catching such a small fraction of people? Yeah, it's a, it's a really good question, and um, um, a lot of it comes down to kind of like you know how inter how the internet has basically you know revolutionised crime, and a lot of the tools and tactics that both government and the private sector had in being able to investigate crime hugely challenged by the internet. Um, and, it, and just a basic example of this is, you know, access to communication data. So for instance, um, uh, and the kind of by default international nature of the crime type. So a typical cyber crime might be an organized crime group, you know, based in Eastern Europe, you know, sending an email, you know, that you potentially might click on that reroutes you to a server that might be based in China and then they conduct a crime that it kind of like, you know, gets cashed out in Europe, you know, the international nature of the communication kind of infrastructure and the international nature by default of the crime type has put huge kind of like processes around being able to have the right data and skills to be able to credibly investigate at scale. So what you do find is, is that you can do this, but the resources required to investigate high tech international cyber crime incredibly uh, uh, incredibly large. So by default, most cybercrime investigations are almost international cybercrime investigations. And the kind of the access to skills, data, process to be able to conduct that um, until you know 10 years ago was basically only done, you know, very rarely, you know, for for, for high profile kind of like serious organized crime cases. So, and what you say now is is for every crime we have to start doing that. And, um, and, and, you know, that, that, that's, that's been the ultimate challenge at this space, which is how do you scale a volume crime that is a specialist high tech crime to investigate? Mm. So um, it's interesting to think about who, who are these people? And there's somebody here who said you've spoken a lot about criminal gangs. Do you differentiate them from state sponsored attacks and are states more of a threat and how can that be mitigated? Um, yeah, so obviously, uh, at the World Economic Forum, we, we kind of we work with with all governments, but I, it'd be kind of remiss of me not to say that clearly, state-based activity is a dominant theme of the cybersecurity agenda. 
And the reason why not only is it a dominant theme for the cybersecurity agenda in the actual kind of attacks um, that you see, which can be hugely problematic and very difficult to defend against, is that also the national security discussion in cybersecurity stops progress on the potentially financially motivated cybercrime. So I would say most organizations are not defending against nation state activity each day. They are typically defending against financially motivated cybercrime gangs. But clearly when there are big international barriers and there are international issues in this field, it's clearly gonna be a barrier to helping cooperation for the rest of this ecosystem. And actually that's actually been one of the major policy blockers and one of the major kind of like framework issues that we've got, which is, Financially motivated cybercrime, which is the major crime type that most people are defending against them, is very much tied up into kind of a national security nation state debate. And that can be problematic for countries to be able to navigate, for sure, definitely. So somebody here, Eric, has asked, do we need a Magna Carta for the digital age, setting out the parameters of individual state and private companies? Yeah, so um, a lot of people say that, and a lot of people think that, you know, uh, really what we should be thinking of doing is about establishing cyber norms and establishing you know responsible behavior in cyberspace and be very very clear about what that should be um, we do have certain legal mechanisms we have the budapest convention you know which most um, countries are signatories of which you know define cyber crime and the rights and responsibilities of, of signatories of that some notable exceptions that they kind of haven't signed up to that but certainly some people are looking at, say, what the world did for, say, uh, money laundering and terrorist financing, which was actually kind of the Fatif regime that set up around that, way, which was much more about, well, actually, if you want to participate in kind of like, you know, the financial system, here's the rights and responsibilities that you have. And we've got penalties um, and an international mechanism to be able to do that. Some people are saying we need the equivalent for that, uh, for cybersecurity as well. And um, certainly state responsibility, uh, both in the public, sorry, you know, responsible behavior in, this, in cyberspace, both in the public sector and the private sector is definitely, is definitely an ongoing debate um, in international relations and, and how you kind of like, how you actually um, operationalize those discussions, yeah. I would say it's very, you know, you know, there are there are some big, big blockers there, and you also have to recognise them as well. So somebody has asked, uh, Matthias has asked, how do you expect your job to change in the next year to five years, given this speedy changing technology and larger geopolitical developments? Yes, yeah, so it's, it's a very, very good question. So my role at the forum as well is very much about, you know kind of like you know trying to shape an international discussion international policy as well um where you know my previous roles have very kind of like been focused on kind of like investigating kind of like really the present threats and defending against the present threats i think my role at the forum was will definitely change as the companies we represent increasingly depend on things like artificial intelligence for their value offering they're increasingly dependent on 5G and ubiquitous connectivity. We have things such as next generation digital identity systems, and we have things such as quantum computing. In many ways, my job is to reflect and um, anticipate the requirements and concerns of global companies and international policy. And if those global companies are increasingly dependent on things such as artificial intelligence, on exploiting quantum computing, on exploiting next generation technology. My role will be really to kind of shape the discussion around, well, here's how you need to think about cybersecurity as your business investing in these technologies. Um, and, it, and it kind of like it'll never stop. You know, there's always a transformative technology around the corner. <laughs> so we've got a lot of people here who are really interested in uh, how do you get into cybersecurity? And I wondered if, You've talked about your role. What other roles are there within cybersecurity? You know, what, what kind of people does it employ? Yeah, so it's, um, one, it's an incredibly diverse field. So I, I would say that whatever type of field or profession that you're kind of thinking about now, almost certainly will touch on some of the issues that I've talked about, you know, 
um, data policy, um, you know, kind of like legal, um, international relations, etc. I would say the field has changed a little bit as well. And, you know, we, we talked about this, Kate, you know, like, um, you know, earlier in the week, which is, I don't think I'd actually would have got recruited out of university now in this field as well. It's definitely a much more technical domain. Um, and, and it's, and it's professionalized, you know, so there, there are lots of different entry points, um, for this in, in lots of different domains. So if you're really interested in kind of like operational security in being defended against cybercrime threats, you know, there's a lot of people recruiting in the, in the major security providers, security operation centers, you know, the big consultancies, um, they're all kind of like, um, um recruiting in this space. If you're super, super interested in, you know, investigating, um, you know, cybercrime groups, you know, the, those agencies are still there and they're always recruiting and always wanting good people as well. Um, so I, I would say that um, really do the research, et cetera, and really kind of understand what attracts you to the, to, to the field as well. Um, um, because it's an incredibly diverse field and there's lots of different career paths um, as well. I'm incredibly lucky I've kind of like moved um, on, on a certain path in certain direction, um, but there's certainly people that I started with that are kind of like highly technical domain experts and say things such as malware analysis or forensic investigations or people that specialize in being liaison officers, um, you know, on international investigations. So it's, it's definitely a very diverse field. Um, I, I would almost certainly say having technical awareness now um is 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 a must you know you you really do need in those early early stages of your career to recognize it is a technical domain and even if you're not technically trained being technically aware or being willing to be technically aware is incredibly important and somebody here kaylina has asked um for somebody who wants to start learning about cybersecurity but doesn't have that background what would you recommend to start comprehending the ins and outs of the terminology and so on yeah so i you know there's there's some great resources from from some kind of like very well known um, um kind of like agencies out there I'd, I'd say if you want a really good understanding of of the threats that we face, you know, um, in Europe, you know, the the Europol um, European Cybercrime Centre, it's a fantastic report um, each year on, on on the kind of European threat assessment. The UK government uh, provides something uh, very very similar through the National Crime Agency as well. I'd say that the National Cyber Security Centre uh, has done a fantastic job of providing really great resources in understanding. Um, the threat the country faces, as well as some of the responses that, that are required as well. So there's lots of different resources that are out there um, online um, that I, I'd really encourage people to uh, kind of tap into, including, of course, the World Economic Forum, which has a fantastic cybersecurity um, platform and set of resources as well. Um, Meg here has asked, what's gender balance like in the field? Yeah, it's a very, very good question. Um, <laughs> Um, there are there are a couple of good studies in this space. It is definitely an issue, and diversity is an issue in the industry. It's definitely recognised as an issue, and a lots of people are trying to put uh, things in place to try and recognise this, including the National Cyber uh, National Cyber Security Centre, which does a lot of good work with universities and trying to promote um, uh, more diversity into the field. I would say that the, the stats are around seventy to thirty as a breakdown but it's highly dependent on the type of field that you're in. Um, so clearly, um, you know, like, you, you, know, um, you know, a lot of forensic investigators um, tend to be men. And um, that's just, that's, a, that's, that's um, um, a current breakdown now. There's a good report on this um, that uh, KPMG did with the National Cybersecurity Center, actually, which was the first study which looked at the UK's uh, cybersecurity diversity issue, made some great policy recommendations at the World Economic Forum, we also recognize that diversity, um, not just gender, all, all kinds of diversity is definitely an issue for the industry to try and address um, uh, for sure. Mm -hmm. um, someone here has asked, would you advise those looking to start a career in cybersecurity to go for a role within industry or into the trade um, with an MSSP or other cybersecurity focused organization? Um, both have benefits. I, I, I think each choice is, is for them as an individual. I think maybe my experience was 
would go to the organization that you think is well run, well organized, um, that's going to give you diversity of experience, that you think that you've got that kind of like a little bit of runway to try different things, work out what you like, what you don't like, et cetera, as well. So I wouldn't be so concerned about do I need to join an MSP? Do I need to join a consultancy? Do I need to join a, a defense contractor as well? I think that's very much a, a choice for the individual understanding, you know, what's important to them as an individual. My only kind of like real advice would be go to the organization that you trust is going to look after you as you start your career and you've got faith in the, in, in the organization and the faith in the leadership of that organization. Mm -hmm. That's good to hear. So for somebody who's um, wanting to enter the field now, what's your kind of advice for how they go about this? What, you know, what skills do they need to hone and what kind of strategy might they want to take? So I think, you know, um, and maybe I kind of, I, I think about my own journey as well, which was, you know, I, I definitely pinball, you know, kind of like pinballed around, you know, different roles. I, I said, kind of like to you, Kate, before I started, you know, when I, when I work in, in, in government, actually, uh, you know, I was basically sent to do cybercrime as kind of like punishment because like I wasn't particularly good at doing some of the other, the other roles. Um, I think at, at this stage, Yes, some of the technical awareness is very important, but there's some real soft skill stuff that's incredibly important, which you can use as well. So I would say the, the kind of the big things are about creativity, communication, clearly being able to demonstrate that you can work in a team. You know, they're the types of skills that are actually really important. I think if there's real technical issues that you kind of like need to go into, most organizations, most programs are going to give you those skill sets. You know, you need to be technically aware, technically adept, but the real things that are important about uh, and maybe some of those soft skills to really hone. So, you know, when you're at university, making sure that you can kind of like, you know, work as a team, work on those joint programs, clearly articulate and communicate issues to different audiences, you know, think laterally, be a problem solver. They were the most important things. Um, when I was first recruited into government, the recruitment process was was wholly about problem solving, teamwork, and communication. Um, you know, they didn't ask me anything about kind of like my technical aptitude or you know, could I read code or reverse engineer X, Y, and Z. You know, what they really tested was can this person work in a team? Can he gain insight? Can he communicate it? And is he a good team player? And um, and they're soft skills that you can gain in any domain. That's great to hear. So. Sadly, we're starting to run out of time and there's masses more questions and we could have carried on talking for so much longer. Um, but it's been a really fascinating discussion um, and I, I've learned so much and I think so many of the audience have as well. So thank you so much, Will. Um, and I'm going to hand over to Patrick O'Donnell, the president of the University of York Students Union to do a vote of thanks. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Kate, and also to Will for joining us. It's been a really fascinating um, discussion this evening, and certainly as a politics student, it's really interesting to hear sort of the behind the scenes, uh, behind that works with, with government in, in Davos, as you, as you said, Will. And I think, you know, we've, we've got students on the call this evening in terms of who seem to be following your path and doing history. So that's really fantastic that, you know, you don't have to be particularly tech, you'll have the expertise, certainly at our age, but you can certainly um, go into that as you're older and I think you know as we live you know we live in quite an uncertain world but it's really reassuring to know that we have York graduates who are part of the fight back I guess in terms of leading nationally um, you know governmental and organizational responses to um, tackling you know, the major issues that we face in terms of cyber crime um, so yeah on behalf of the University of York and students thank you very much Will and Kate as well for joining us this evening um, it's been a really interesting conversation so thank you very much <laughs>